Good afternoon, every good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to this special edition of the Humanities Forum. My name is Ian Bernhoft, and I am the Assistant Director of the Humanities Forum, and I'm not going to talk for very long, so you can get comfortable. I'm going to get off the stage right quick. But in case you've never been to one of these events before, the Humanities Forum is an opportunity for members of the Providence College community, namely you, to deepen your engagement with the intellectual life of the college. So, you know, beyond the classroom, you come to these sorts of events, which we have on most Fridays and the occasional Tuesday and Wednesday, to hear speakers, usually from outside of the university, talk about their research, their ideas, the questions that they're trying to solve, the things that motivate them, in a way that you can, you know, it spurs your own thinking and you can walk away having a little bit of a more well-rounded education, which I'm sure is what you and your family are paying for. Um, today's Humanities Forum will feature uh, Dr. Peter Levine, who will be introduced subsequently in a second, but it's a shared collaboration between the Frederick Douglass Project, which I helm, which encourages you to get involved in debates, discussion, deliberation, the habits that inform a healthy democracy, and conversations for change, which um, Professor Nicholas Longo and Quincy Beverly run, and I'm not gonna talk about that more because I think the next person will. So, just a couple of procedural notes. One is, I urge you to put away your laptops. I know that you're doing things, extra credit things on there, but we have paper, we have pencils, I'm sure, and uh, this way you can give your, the speaker your full attention. You can also not cause any distractions to your neighbors. So this is a good thing for you to be fully present in the room. The other thing is uh, Dr. Levine will be speaking for around 40 minutes, 45 minutes. After that, we're gonna have a question and answer period. And we always kick off the question and answer period with the first question being asked by a student. So if you happen to be a student, have those wheels turning as you're listening to think about what am I most curious about? What do I want to hear about? What do I want to understand better? So you can stick your hand up at when the time comes. And then the last announcement is that immediately following the talk and the Q&A, we'll have a reception just down the hall in the great room, which promises to have all sorts of tasty munchies and refreshing drinks for your edification and delight. Okay. With that being said, I'm going to turn the mic over to Valeria Morillo, who's going to be introducing our speaker tonight. Okay. Welcome to the Humanities Forum with Dr. Peter Levin from Tufts University. Today's talk is co-sponsored by the Frederick Douglass Project and the Dialogue Inclusion and Democracies Lab Conversations for Change Project. My name is Valeria Morillo. I'm a senior finance major and French minor. I'm also a student fellow of the Dialogue Inclusion and Democracy Research Lab. I oversee the deed wall at the Ryan School of Business and work with other students' leaders to promote civil discourse on campus through the Democracy Walls and the Conversations for Change initiative. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Peter Levin. Dr. Peter Levin is the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Professor of Citizenship and Public Affairs in the Tufts University Tisch College of Civic Life. Trained as a moral and political philosopher, Dr. Levin has spent most of his career conducting applied research and organizing professional efforts related to civic life in the United States, including sustained work on civic education, voting rights, public deliberation, and social movements. Dr. Levine is the author of eight books, including most recently, What Should We Do? A Theory of Civic Life, which is the subject of his talk today. I asked Dr. Neat Longo for some personal comments about Dr. Levine, and I was asked to introduce Dr. Levine because he's known Dr. Levine since he was a graduate student. Dr. Longo said, Peter has a rare combination. He's both the smartest person in the room, he was a Rhodes Scholar, has published many books, even works of fictions, and keeps a daily blog. But then, even more importantly, he's the nicest person you'll meet. He listens, is generous with his time, and he's generally kind and caring. Welcome, Dr. Peter Levine. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, that should work. Thank you, thanks so much for the introduction, and Nick, for your kind words. I would try to be what you said I was. I hope I 
to I at least give that impression at the moment. Um, and it's so lovely to be here, back actually at, at Providence College. I've been here before, and what a great turnout as well. Uh, so this is a, a kind of presentation of this book. And I know that actually some of you have to read it in Professor Longo's class. So for you, I hope this will be not boring because it'll be fairly quick and a take on the book and an opening for you to ask questions. And for those who haven't read the book and are never going to, uh, it should stand on its own. It doesn't require that this, the, these remarks do not require that you've read the book. Um, so one way in, it's got, a, it's got a question on the front cover. And so I want to talk at the beginning here about why that question is important. And, you know, we, um, we ask lots of good questions in universities and colleges. Um, and the question, what should we do, is not the only good question. But I want to argue that it's a really important question. Um, so often in the social sciences, or, or for example in business, um, you would ask questions like this. You know, why do people act and think the way they do? So why are those people all on that street walking that way? And also, um, how would their behavior change if we change something else? So if we put up the signs there that say this is the way to the exit, will people behave in a different way? So we're talking about how do people behave, and we're trying to explain and figure out how to alter it. Good questions. Worth asking. Um, in philosophy, which is my original discipline, we're often asking what is right, what is good, what is fair, um, versions of that question. Of course, there are other philosophical questions as well. Um, Another way to put it is we're, we're often asking, how should things be? How should they be? Um, that's my colleague and friend, Erin Kelly, asking who belongs in prison. That's a good philosophical question. She thinks very few people. But that's her answer. But the question is a good question. Um, of course, in, in you know, ethics is a part of philosophy. But in, in ethics, often the question is either what makes an individual person a good person, which is a question you should obviously ask, or um, a different way of getting into ethics, the questions of ethics, would be to say, what should I do? Uh, should I tell a lie when uh, uh, Nazi soldiers at my door is an ethical question. Again, these are all good questions. Um, and one more, I think, slide of this nature. Um, when we study public policy at any level, including in high school or earlier, we're often asking what should be done. For example, what kind of prison should the state of Rhode Island have? Um, if any. And or another version of it is kind of what should the government do becomes the question. So again, these are good questions, not discouraging anyone from asking them or studying them. But it does, they do kind of sidestep this question. Um, and in fact, I think our whole culture tends to sidestep this question in certain ways. It does, tends not to ask this question. And it's only four words long, what should we do? And I'm going to claim that it's the, the great civic question. It's the question that, in fact, what does it mean to be civic? It means that you're asking this question. It's only four words long, so I'm going to take a moment over each word. So um, it ends with the word to do. Why? Most obviously because we need to do things. Uh, we need to make the world a better place. We need to actually act. Sometimes not acting is the right thing to do, but that's also kind of an action. The other reason that's a good question to end with do is because it's a kind of um, a kind of challenge, a kind of discipline to ourselves to ask what should we do. Not what is our opinion about things, what do we like or dislike, but what should we do. There's a kind of, a kind of difficulty to that question. What, is, what can, should we do that I think is an important difficulty. It challenges us in a good way. It's we. And this is maybe the, the most, the hardest one to keep in view. Because so often it, in a classroom or in a community group, of any type, the question of the we will um, kind of vanish. And it will become a question about what somebody else should do. Um, it's also, so it's about we. It's about us. It's about like the people in this room, this number of people, what should we do? And it's also not I. And so what should I do is a good question. But there are two problems with that. And I'll put it really bluntly. I am stupid and I am weak. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little, but only a little, because I'm weak in the sense I can't accomplish very much, and I'm stupid in the sense that I have biases um, and limitations. I don't know many things. I don't know, for example, the circumstances of your lives. Um, so I need to be in a we in order to figure out what we should do. It should because we need to make sure we're, doing, we're going for the right goals. We have the right ends or goals. And we're doing the right things to get there. The good 
just, fair, right things. And that's a tough one because um, you can't just look up what we should do. Right? The, the value question is, uh, or to put it a different way, there's not a regular discipline that generates answers to that question um, that people agree about. So in fact, people are going to disagree about what we should do. But serious groups of people who really care don't put that question aside and say, well, it's just a matter of opinion and everybody just has a different opinion about justice. No, they, they actually get very serious about trying to figure out what they should do. And you can observe this if you go to a community group in any kind of culture that they're not going to say, oh, the should is just a matter of opinion. They're going to start getting very heated about what actually should be done. And that's right, because as human beings, we should be trying to figure out what we should do. And finally, the word what is kind of my hook for, it's a little bit of an excuse for saying, we're also responsible for the facts. Right? So you have to know what's actually going on. You want to talk about housing in Providence, Rhode Island, because that concerns you. You've got to know who lives here, and how many houses there are, and um, what the trends are, and how much the property values are. And, or if you want to know about climate change, you've got to understand some science. So the what is important, too. Now, um, I want to address this issue. Often, students will raise it if I give them enough time to think about it. But I just think it's super important, so I want to raise it. Um, is that the right question if you are, for everybody, particularly if you're oppressed? So if other people are being deeply unjust to you and have been maybe for centuries and centuries, why should you ask, what should we do? Why shouldn't the question be, what should they do? So I agree with that. Very often, the people who should do something are not the people who are asking the question, what should we do, in a good way. They are just doing the bad things that they're doing, and they're not thinking, well, but that's the nature of the world we live in, which is a heavily unjust world. So very often, the people who should be asking, what should we do, don't ask it, which leaves it to other people to ask the question the best they can. Now, often, um, your answer is going to be, we should get somebody else to make a change. What should we do? So if we were actually had a meeting here and we were talking about some issue, we might well decide that what we need to do is to get somebody else to change their behavior, perhaps somebody powerful or rich. But that is something that comes back to us. We then have to have a strategy for accomplishing that. We have to make, make them listen to us, make them change. And so ultimately, I think you can't escape, unfortunately, from asking the question yourself in the groups that you're in. So that's the core question. I'm, I'm going to just claim that's the civic question. Um, but it's embedded in a lot of other questions. So you can't really ask, what should we do, unless you have some idea of who you are and what groups you belong to. Um, you bring that into the group, and you should. And um, it's not always an obvious question which groups you belong to. Right? Because you can be officially in a group, but not sure if anybody else in the group cares about you or respects you or likes you, and then you don't know if you're really in the group. Right? You're, you've got a membership, but you're not sure you're part of the group. Or you cannot acknowledge you're part of a group. You are part of the group, but you don't remember it. So you, we have to reason. What I'm trying to say is we have to reason all our lives about who I am and which groups do I belong to. But they connect to the question of what should we do. But let's imagine for the sake of it that we have an idea right at the, in our heads at the moment about who we are, who I am, who you are, what group we belong to, and we're trying to decide what should we do. Now I'm going to suggest that, well, a group is going to be concerned about the thing that the group's concerned about, racial equity, climate change, taxes are too high, whatever they're concerned about. So that's, of course, what they're going to talk about. But there's another layer, which is questions that have to do with basically how they organize themselves. And they're going to have to think about those questions, too. And they're not infinite questions. There's, I'm going to claim there's just a list. Um, so first of all, they're going to have to figure out how to create a group, or if they have one, if they're lucky enough to have one, how to sustain it so that it actually functions. Because there's going to be a bunch of people in that group, and those people are going to want to do their own thing. Uh, they're going to want to go home and watch TV. I mean, they're not going to want to be part of the group. So how do you create a group that actually gives people uh, the incentives or rewards or motivations uh, or recognition that brings them back and that causes them to be part of a group? And so that is a, an art and a science of figuring out how to make groups work. And there are many, many different kinds of functional groups, little, huge, online, offline. But always they're going to have to have some kinds of rules or norms. So you show up, 
you get some of the pizza. You don't show up, you know, you're left out. The kind of rules and norms that make groups work, and they're going to have to build some degree of trust inside the group. And so those are things that have, you have to think about. Secondly, if you have a group, especially if it's diverse, and diverse is good, then you're going to have disagreement about values. You're not going to agree about what the goals should be or what means are OK to use them to get to the uh, goals. So the only thing we can do as human beings is um, talk that through with the other people. Well, you can also uh, consult your soul or God or other sources. But as members of a civic community, you're going to have to talk to other people. So then the questions are, how, do we, how should you actually talk and listen to other people? And this gets into questions of kind of interpersonal ethics. What, what are the right ways of talking to other people? Um, what's an acceptable comment? What's a in, totally inappropriate comment in a given group? How do you, um, it's also a question of skill. How do you actually listen to people so that you hear them? And then it's a question of design again. So um, how do we design? So this is one forum, which involves a guy from Tufts standing up here with a microphone talking to you for 45 minutes, and then you asking questions. That's a format. It works somewhat. Um, Twitter is a different institution for conversation. The, uh, you know, the newspaper is a different institution for conversation. How do we design institutions that work for conversation? And the third category is, OK, back to the issue that the people who should be changing their behavior probably aren't. So what, how do we do, what do we do with the people who um, are uh, not behaving as they should and not listening to us? And here we need to figure out, I think, basically how to organize an effective social movement. Because social movements are people's main mechanisms for changing systems when, they don't, when the systems are not acting right. And I think we need to learn the techniques and skills of nonviolence. Now, I, I happen not to be um, a pacifist, so I think violence is sometimes appropriate. Um, military action is sometimes appropriate. Revolutions are sometimes appropriate. But nonviolence has a tremendous amount to teach us about how to make change. And also, realistically, it is actually the only way that most change gets made in a country like the United States, where, for example, the army is really, really powerful and not likely to be overthrown. So a lot of change is going to be nonviolent. Oh, we can talk about that more, because that's all of this is controversial, but certainly that is. Um, if you would like to, some of you may know about this, but um, I've kind of put the same, um, the same graph, the same chart, but I've put it on a website with some materials um, uh, for each of those. So if you're interested in how should we speak in response to others, and you click on the uh, arrow on that website, you'll find some resources. Actually, Professor Longo, I was thinking of trying to put your whole Ask You book that's coming out on there with your permission. We'll talk about that later, because it would be a very nice fit. Um, but anyway, that, this is, I'm advertising the, the website, but I also want to say two things about this. This is a, in my mind, this is a lifelong learning agenda. Till the day I die, I'm not going to know enough about any of these things. We all should be learning constantly. The world also changes, so how to speak in response to others is different on Twitter than it was in, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, it's also a research agenda, so none of these things are fully explored by scholars adequately. We need to do research on all these. Um, so now I want to, let me just do a quick time check for myself. Good. I want to just walk you through a little bit more detail about how you think about these things. And I guess this part is kind of illustrative, because I, I can only give some examples. But with each, so there are three big questions. You'll see, I'll fill this in. Three big questions. One of them is, the first one is, how can we create a, or sustain a functioning group? And for each one of them, I'm really drawn to a, a tradition of thought and practice. A bunch of, a community you, is another word you could use, of thinkers who have both thought about these issues and also experimented. And so I, in the book, I talk about each of those traditions in a chapter. And the first one is, is exemplified by her, the late um, Eleanor Ostrom. We, you knew her, right? Professor Battistoni knew her. So um, did you? Um, so she died about five years ago. Eleanor Ostrom, she was um, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics. She was a wonderful person, and she was a professor at Indiana University. And she, I'm going to talk briefly about her ideas real, real quick. But if you want an image for the kind of problem she was trying to figure out is simply how do people sustain a functioning group? So those are three you know, members of the Tufts University women's crew team. And they're walking at the same time with the boat over their head. And that's an accomplishment. It's a coordination problem, and she studied that. How do people do that? So I'm going to um, 
talk about each of those three traditions, and then I'm going to end. So a little bit about Lynn Ostrom. When she was coming up, learning the, her business, uh, learning her, tr her profession, she was taught about the tragedy of the commons. And are some of you familiar with that idea? Raise your hand if you're familiar. Yeah, we'll not call on you. So you can get away with it. Actually, not very many people. What, one more try. So you know about the tragedy of the commons? Few people, but not too many. So the idea, the tragedy, so she was taught, as if it was true, simply true, that if you have some public space or good or thing of value, whatever it is, and there aren't really restrictions about who can use it, it will be destroyed. Because basically people are selfish and they will individually act in their own self-interest so that the good is destroyed. By the way, I, I googled um, Tragedy of the Commons Rhode Island and that picture came up. So I'm not sure if it was taken in Rhode Island, but I think it illustrates Rhode Island, I'm sorry. Um, and it's, it's an somebody's idea of an illustration of the Tragedy of the Commons, which is if there's a body of water and you can throw trash in, people will throw trash in until, the tragedy, until it's destroyed. And she said, sometimes that happens. But um, so the tragedy of the commons is a super famous phrase that she did not come up with. She tried to change it. She said, actually, sometimes we succeed in managing public goods, things that belong to everybody. We some, people sometimes succeed in this. So it's not a tragedy, which is a, a story that inevitably ends in defeat and failure and horror. It's a drama. We don't know whether it will come out well or badly. It depends on the characters and the drama. And Sometimes, so sometimes the story ends well, sometimes it doesn't. You can clean up the water, uh, but you have to do it right. Um, that may seem obvious, but just try to give you a flavor. There was this tremendous pressure by economists to tell you that you can't basically clean up the water because people will pollute it. Um, the, the context of setting matters, but so do the rules. And we can change the rules. We human beings can change the rules. And very many of the examples of success are old. So human beings for millions of years have been solving problems like that. They have been managing collective assets. Um, it's actually in the last 150 years that our biggest disasters have occurred and our failures. So we need to learn from sort of our traditions. And again, that's not a random photograph of just some people um, under a tree. That was an illustration of a scholarly article showing about solving problems of collective action. And those people are doing so under a tree um, by meeting under a tree and figuring out rules. So Lynn, I won't talk you through the slide, it's very busy. Um, you can glance at it. Lynn and her many colleagues tried to glean from examples of human cooperation good ideas, basically good principles, good rules of thumb that you could learn, um, that, you could, that could guide you. So she ended up, at the, at the time of her death, she had really sort of seven design principles. And she would expect this list to continue to uh, evolve with more research. Um, so these are tips that people should know if they want to organize anything. I'll just give you one example as an example, only example. So number three says graduated sanctions. So that what she learned from observing traditional behavior all around the world and doing other kinds of research was when people don't do the right thing, they don't contribute the way they should, it's, you're in a club, a student club, and there's the person who's not doing anything to help, taking advantage, getting the free pizza and not doing anything, there should be penalties. The penalties should be pretty automatic, and they should be very mild. And they should only get serious if the person repeatedly violates the rules. So you should actually try this with roommates or other kinds of communities like that. You don't want to just ignore um, failure to cooperate, because that'll cause uh, tension and unfairness. Other people will uh, do too much. It's unfair. But you also don't want to have seriously high penalties, because then it's not fair, and also because it ruptures your community. So you want to have very mild penalties that get gradually worse. And people have been doing this for probably millions of years, at least through recorded history. And these are the kinds of things you can learn. So I'm not going to ask you to learn them, but the idea here is this is the learning agenda. So over time, you should learn these things and figure them out in your own way. Um, her kind of work is very much in the news. Um, she's a major thinker, probably always will be. But I wanted to mention a couple of things. Well, I'll mention one. I don't think I'm going to talk about the second for reasons of time. But her second big research project, her first was on water. But her second was on police. And it was particularly on racial disparities in policing. She surveyed uh, residents about whether police were helpful or not. And she looked carefully at black and white Americans. And what she basically found was 
consistent with their principles, I can't go through the whole story, but consistent with their principles, police were more um, valued by their communities and seen as more fair if they had less money. So um, the lower budgets for police were better, which is a little, you know, maybe a little surprising because usually more money for anything makes it better, but less money for police made it better. And so this is being quite a bit cited in, in debates about defunding police. I don't think she would go so far as to get rid of police, and whether you would or not is up to you, but she had some really interesting evidence about spending less money on policing. I'm going to skip this because just for reasons of time. So the second tradition is about asking the question of how should we uh, address disagreements when we don't agree. And I think that's per very pertinent, especially for two of the um, sponsoring groups here, right? Uh, the Frederick Douglass group and the, what's the other group? that Conversations, Conversations for Change, right? Um, and I draw here on an um, elderly German philosopher, sociologist named Jürgen Habermas. He's in his 90s. He's still going. And people who are in dialogue and debate with him. So a very prominent current example is Daniel Allen, who is in his mode, although she also argues with him. And she's current. She's at Harvard now. Um, and if you want an illustration, the first tradition, think of some quiet behavior of cooperation, like those women with the boat. But if you want to think of the second tradition, think of a bunch of people at a meeting arguing about what to do. That's a town meeting in, in India. Um, so a quick, quick talk. I did a quick intro to Ostrom, so kind of whet your appetite. Quick intro to Habermas. So when you think about Habermas, imagine a public forum, a public debate. In some, it could be online, but it could be in a meeting. And the kind of um, debate that's very familiar, at least to me, and probably you recognize this, would be this sort of debate, where somebody stands up like two years ago in a public forum and says, our public schools need to reopen again for everybody next year. OK, it's a statement. It's a statement of opinion in a public sphere about something that matters to the community. When we were debating, I think probably in Providence, but everywhere, whether to reopen the schools. And Habermas would say that when you do that, so I stand up and I say the school should be back. Everybody else should, is and should be thinking about the truth, the rightness, and the sincerity of my claim. So I'm saying our public school should be open. You're asking, am I, is my um, statement based on the best understanding of the truth that we could have? So is my, under, is my statement consistent with science about COVID and transmission and masks and kids? Also, is it right or fair or just? So am I thinking straight about the fairness to and the disparate impacts on different children and on teachers and on parents? And third, am I sincere? Am I actually saying what I believe? Or am I saying, am I saying that for some other reason, like to curry favor with people or something? And the point is, when I say it, you can, um, ask, the, you can ask questions or make statements which test my truth, rightness, and sincerity. And if we do that right, if we structure it right, we can actually move as a community towards having opinions that are more true, more right, and more sincere. So what we're doing in a public conversation is trying to accomplish truth, rightness, and sincerity together. But we have to structure it right. So what we want um, are the things on the left. Uh, we want a kind of norm in the room that people are going to try to give good reasons. And we want the good reasons to be the things that persuade other people. Not, for example, bribes or threats or status differentials, but good reasons. We want everybody who should be there to be there, and we want it to matter what we say. We don't want it to be just a, um, a, a, a fruitless conversation. Um, so Harmas um, talks about an ideal speech situation as a kind of dream, an imagined thing. There is no such thing as a really ideal speech situation, but the reason we should think about it is because we can try to move towards it. So in a, given, in a real room, is everybody included? Is it only good reasons that persuade, or does the guy with the mic get to persuade? Right? So um, we can ask critical questions about the conversation. The reason for the pictures, picture on the right is because Habermas argues that in order to have these good speech situations, we have to have the right venues for them. And those are real places. Well, they can be online, but they're real. Um, they're, they're, they're actual places. So that is a coffee shop in late 18th century England, late 17th century England. And coffee shops are businesses. They sell coffee. They take money in. You pay for coffee. They offer entertainment. But in se late 17th century England, they became places where people like to go to give reasons about public matters. It be that's the thing that 
they wanted to do. And so, um, and of course, not all were included. There aren't any poor people there. Um, country was probably pretty racially homogeneous, but there's no diversity of that type. But there's some diversity there, both men and women. And there's a norm, there's an ideal developing here that everybody should be included. And so we try to move gradually towards that ideal. So I took a, pic a screenshot of your business school, right? Your business school um, discussion board as a, as a kind of, um, as a uh, 21st century version of that. And so he's asking us, how do we design these things well? Um, and that's always in the news. So at any given moment, it's super easy to find. These are within the last, uh, that's January 28th. These are within the last couple days. Um, conversations about um, how to structure the institutions in which we have conversations. Should Trump have a Twitter account? Should Representative Omar be on the House Foreign Affairs Committee? Yes, definitely. <laughs> but that's a different, that's my opinion. Um, but there's a constant conversation about how to structure our institutions um, for a conversation. So, that's the second body of practice. I'm getting near the end here. So the third is about how do we uh, address change groups that exclude us. Um, the two theorists who I talk about at length in the book are Mohandas K. Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Um, as a, not just a practitioner and not just an eloquent speaker, but as a very serious thinker and theorist. And if you want an um, illustration, think of any kind of mass nonviolent um, protest from anywhere in the world, they always are occurring. Quick, uh, in, quick little taste of that kind of argument in a different style. Um, so I recently typed social movement into Google image search. Uh, and this is what I got. So we could, we could, in a classroom, I'd ask you what you see, and it would take a little while. But I think what you would say after a little while of looking at it is lots of people in public spaces looking kind of angry carrying signs. And so that would be your definition of a social movement. And I want to say that's kind of misleading. It's not really Google's fault. That's the part of a social movement that produces the best photographs. That's why it's on the image search. But it's misleading. And it, it does, this idea of a social movement is a um, prevailing idea in our culture that's misleading. So we te a lot of people tend to think that a social movement consists basically of individuals, lots of them, who have come as individuals into some public space. That's what they think. And what they're missing is that social movements, Black Lives Matter, whatever, um, are always underneath them amalgams, combinations of existing organization and networks. You can always find those there. There's never just a bunch of people in the street. There's always a bunch of organizations behind them. Um, second, a lot of people asked about social movements would say they're about protest. Protests can be important. Protests can be effective. Protests can also be ineffective. They're only the tip of the iceberg of a social movement. They're never the only thing that works. And sometimes they don't work at all. Um, in fact, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you could almost say protests are really useful as an opportunity to recruit. So very often at a protest, there'll be some organizers in the corner in the old days with clipboards, nowadays with a cell phone or whatever, basically collecting contact information for the people who showed up because it's after the protest that you're going to start doing the real work of a social movement. Um, very often we think that a social movement is defined by some position that it takes. So it's the, you know, climate, um, this, the climate movement is defined by being against uh, carbon or, uh, you, you know, burning carbon. But, and, and that's what's on the signs. But real social movements always are spaces of a tremendous amount of internal debate and disagreement. All those people standing there with signs that look similar actually disagree with each other, at least on some things. And the conversation is always unfolding. So if you think about the American Civil Rights Movement between 1954 and 1967, you see a tremendous change in their position. Um, and, oops. Um, yeah, I guess that's, that was my thing. So this was the, the parallel part where I'm trying to give you a quick introduction to thinking about social movements. With each, of these, um, with each of these quick introductions, what I'm really trying to do is sketch out your, what I'm advocating for you, and you have to decide if you want to accept my advocacy, is a learning agenda. So I'm saying you need to learn how to organize things so that they persist, how to have good conversations about values, and how to structure social movements. Um, so, uh, and of course, social movements are in the news every day. Um, so I'll just walk you through this, and then we'll stop, and I think I'll be right on time. 
So um, just as a kind of summary, we've got three named authors, but I talk about a lot of other people in the book. Eleanor Ostrom, Jürgen Habermas, and Gandhi and King have to share their space there. Um, they have different basic problems that up upset them. Um, for Ostrom, it's a failure to get something that everybody thinks would be good. We all want the water in uh, you know, the bay to be clean, but we fail to get clean water because we all behave um, selfishly. For Habermas, the problem is that people's opinions, instead of being thoughtful, informed, open-minded opinions, are somehow manipulated. Manipulated by, I didn't talk about that that much when I introduced him, but manipulated by power, by money, by propaganda. And so we have to design to avoid that. And for Gandhi and King, the problem is that some people are not treating other people as fully human beings. Right? They're dehumanizing somebody else, and sometimes they're taking some of that onto themselves. So the starting point um, for Ostrom is we know what we want, like clean water. We don't really know how to get it. For Habermas, the problem is often we want, at least some of us want bad things, and we're not thinking well together about what we should want. And for Gandhi and King, it's that some people won't recognize other people standing at all. Um, so a classic example for Ostrom, she's not only about the environment, but she's partly about the environment, would be that human beings destroy an environmental ac asset. That's something that happens every day. For Habermas, a classic example will be propaganda, some powerful actor irradiating everybody's brains with bad ideas because of their power. And for Gandhi and King, it'll be oppression based in, in both cases on race or ethnicity. Um, they use different ways of thinking about this. Ostrom is an economist. She used game theory. I don't know if anybody studied game theory in an econom economics class, but she did a lot of it. Habermas is a sociologist philosopher. Gandhi and King are both theologians in different traditions, Hinduism and Christianity. And they're also strategists, drawing a lot on basically military strategy, but operating in a nonviolent context. They have a different, this, I'm almost done. They have a different view of the government. Um, for Gandhi and King, it's the easiest to say. The government is a target. It's the thing that is doing the wrong thing. It's behaving badly, and our job is to change it. Neither Gandhi or King wants to be the government, neither ran for office, neither wants to be the president. They want to target the government. So the government is an other, it's an outsider, it's something that we, we target. For Habermas, a democratic government is a very good thing to have. It's the only entity that should legitimately make decisions about the law. And so its job is to make decisions, and our job is to influence it through our voice. So we should advocate to the government to um, in normal, everyday ways to make good law. And for Ostrom, there is no government. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but what she, what she notes is that if you actually look at any given government, it kind of dissolves before your eyes because it's actually a whole bunch of different bureaus, offices, parties, decision makers, offices, um, you know, office holders. It's the Providence Police Department and the school committee and the mayor's office and the state of Rhode Island. And, and all the people in those associations are also, all those people in those different roles are also in other associations. They're also in the church, in the Rotary Club. And um, the power of the government is a variable. Sometimes it's very powerful, but sometimes it's very weak, uh, less powerful than other institutions. So actually, the state is not some other thing. The state is one of the things that's around us, along with you know, the church and the university and the, and the um, media and so on. And finally, um, maybe I'll leave you this. This is what each of them would say you have to learn, and so do I for the rest of my life. Um, for Ostrom, how to cooperate. For Habermas, how to deliberate. That is how to have exchanges of ideas to get towards truth. And for Gandhi and King, how to make an effective sacrifice. That is how to give up things put oneself at risk, sacrifice, but in an effective way so that change will follow, so that you're not throwing away your life, but you are um, effectively sacrificing. Um, yeah, and so um, I'm done, but um, I would love any questions or comments, or pushback would be wonderful. I've, I've gotten it before, and I, I, can, I can take it. Um, but if you're interested in kind of provocations for your own questions, you might think about, about those. Those are questions I thought we might talk about. Thank you.
grab the first question. Um, make sure that I get to you with the microphone before you speak so that your words can be recorded for posterity. And if you want to say who you are, I'm always curious. Oh, hi, I'm yeah. Zay, I'm a junior. I'm a creative writing and poli sci major. So uh -huh. this particular discussion kind of seems really relevant in the era of fake news, which you have up on your board, which yeah. is, yeah. you know, kind of stole my thunder there. Oh. Well, sure. um, so I was just wondering, like, how does one reconcile this concept of cooperation, deliberation, and um, sacrifice in a world where the facts are muddled yeah. at best? And maybe more muddled or more muddleable than they used to be because, I mean, just as one very easy to explain example, deep fakes, I don't know how many people have been following this, but it's really scary that you can make a manipulated image that looks like it's, you know, Hillary Clinton saying something and she didn't even say it. Yeah. So, um, great question. I want to make sure my answer is really crisp because I want to encourage other comments. Um, it's hard. And your generation is going to have to deal with this, and I'm not sure I've got great solutions. But I will say this, I think we've gotten to a little bit of a point at this moment of excessive discouragement about the possibilities of human beings communicating thoughtfully with each other, partly because our systems are, our structures and designs are very bad. So I keep on using Twitter, but it is very badly designed for good discussion, and partly for other reasons. So right now, a prevailing view in a lot of, like my world in, in um, research, is basically People are stupid and they hate each other. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm intentionally exaggerating, but that's basically what you, are, for those who are scholars, the book by Akin and Bartels, um, uh, whatever it's called, a few years ago, is, is this big fancy book, very prominent, and it basically says people are stupid and they hate each other. And I think we're underestimating. So I, what I want to, what I want to say to be crisp is we got to keep a little hope, <laughs> because we're at a moment of very low hope about this kind of thing, and we're just about to say, forget it. People just can't go online and not just dox and hate each other in awful ways and spread fake news. And I don't think we're, um, I, don't, I, I think if you, that's your mindset, you don't even try to develop better platforms, processes, um, institutions. And I think we can do better. Um, and that, I don't mean to dismiss because it's actually an extremely important question, but I, and I don't mean to say it's like easy, but I don't think it's impossible. And I think a lot of people are now kind of deciding that's impossible. Good afternoon, Dr. Levine. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Matt Levin. I'm a pol political science major, Spanish minor. I'm a sophomore. Great. Uh, what do you think American political parties miss uh, when trying to reach out to and organize young people? Uh, they don't. They don't do that, that much at all, as as you might might know. I mean, there was a f um, it's out of date, but ten years ago, I was part of a study where we actually asked um, county party leaders. Um, well, one of the questions we asked them was, what's the most important group for you to do outreach to? And then after they'd answered that question, we said, and what's another important group for you to uh, reach out to? And in neither the first try nor the second try, did hardly any of them said young people. I, I don't remember the number anymore. It was something like 8% or something said on two tries. And you know, young people are kind of the future of the party, but so they don't even, they don't even try. Um, partly because they've decided that they need to go for the people they know are going to vote. Partly because the ones they know they're going to vote are, uh, they know that because they look at the list of registered voters, which doesn't include as many young people because they haven't registered yet. So this is a basic structural problem. I mean, um, and to the extent that it's gotten a little better, it's because young people have kind of demanded space in the parties. But it's, it, the parties are still run by old people. The, the other thing about the, our parties now is that they are mostly labels for ideologies. They're mostly not organizations. So um, I don't know Rhode Island, but in Massachusetts, which is a bigger state than Rhode Island, both parties put together have a budget of only a few million dollars a year for the entire party. So they employ hardly anybody. So mostly it's a label for two different ideologies. And of course, those ideologies are defined by hating each other. So it's a label that exacerbates division. Actually, competition and division in some ways is good, but what we don't have is people actually working in the party office, which is bad for your generation because it means that there's nobody there who you can relate to. So if you try to attach yourself to the Democratic or Republican or Green or any other party of Rhode Island, you're not going to find many people in it. Um, and so, yeah. 
sorry, that's another, uh, both questions I kind of might be at risk of giving discouraging answers. It's a battle. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. Got coming, I think, but uh, by way of. Come Hello, on. my name's Lexi. I'm a sophomore, um, also in Matt's class um, for D Professor Longo. Oh, yeah. um, and I'm a bio major, business innovation minor, so thank you for coming. Yeah, sure. um, one question that I have, we actually posted it in a forum for um, Professor Longo and Dr. Beverly's class. Yeah. Um, and it was, my question was based on your topic in your book called Impersonal Politics. I thought that was super oh. interesting. And I was just wondering, um, how can you ensure that our society doesn't su succumb to just operating solely on that idea of impersonal politics? And I think for all of us in the room, just being younger change makers, if you feel that we can have an impact on that in any way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so for people who haven't read, which you don't have to have, um, the idea is that we human beings really don't just want to accomplish things with politics. We also actually want to feel like we belong. We want people to, we want to know somebody in, um, who knows our name and cares about us. Um, and so um, that's the side that often gets overlooked when we try to design. I mean, to go back to the previous question, p political parties don't offer that at all. Right? There's, because the, there's no place you can kind of go and meet the other Democrats, maybe on campus, but very unlikely that in the city of Providence there's some place you can go and kind of, they know your name and they care about you. And so that part, um, is really hard to sustain. And so um, uh, partly what I'm just trying to say is when we design better institutions, we have to remember the purely personal part, the purely um, interpersonal part, the, the, and it's emotional. So the, the notion that people want to be um, cared about. And it also leads people to um, make sacrifices when they do feel that. So if you're trying to explain why do people actually give something up, um, why would they do that? The answer is usually because somebody else cares about them. Um, even if it's as little as why do you give up your evening to go to a meeting instead of doing something by yourself, it's because the people at the meeting care about you. So we have to design our systems to um, be relational in that way so that other people care about us. I think we'll go this way too. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Professor Levine. Um, I'm Julia Renault. I'm here from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, and we recently co-authored the first ever uh, Civic Health Index for Rhode Island, yeah. which is right here, along with Professor Longo and a lot of great partners. Um, but one of the findings was that Rhode Island is really strong and actually number one in the nation in terms of tight connections between friends and family, yeah. also really strong in terms of kind of traditional electoral participation, like voting, but really significantly weaker nationally, pretty low nationally in terms of these kind of, you know, greater, more amorphous we things like volunteering, participating in groups, um, yep. you know, organizations. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on kind of how people, how we can leverage those tight connections and that connection to government into a more broader kind of social fabric and civic fabric. Yeah. So we do want both, right? Because we want, um, at some point, we have to get everybody together to have a state that works. Um, but it's also fair enough for people to want to associate with people who are like them in many ways and to get benefit out of that. Um, that's going to promote racial and other kinds of segregation, but it's also people need to be able to associate with people they love and care about. So you kind of want both. You want people to be with people they um, want to be with, and you also want them to come out of where they are. Um, and so it's very helpful to diagnose, and we used to be involved with the Civic Health Project. I'm glad it's still working. It's very helpful to get the, the details. So I suspect like Florida would be the opposite where um, you know, people don't know each other because they just moved there, but they have some bigger associations. Um, I mean, the, the traditional kind of best moments in our civic life were when we had the two things tied together so that you could be, you know, you joined the union because your workplace was unionized. You didn't even like unions. You just joined the union. But you found a way. It gave you a way to progress. You made progress. You rose higher. You found yourself at the state union council, and then you found yourself at the AFL and you met people from not just Rhode Island but from Wyoming and we did have some of that um, always segregated in, in many ways but we did have some of that and we've lost a lot of that because a lot of our um, civic life now is kind of mom, it, mom and pop size it's 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 little nonprofits that have a little organization and they don't they don't network together and they don't get bigger it's not fair to say that completely because there are networks but it's harder to accomplish that so um, I think part of it is learning some of the uh, nuts and bolts, actually, of organizing at a bigger scale. 
I'll, I'll say one more thing, which is when there was all the sudden upsurge of um, so-called resistance after Donald Trump, what, what happened is a lot of people who hadn't been very involved in politics suddenly got involved. Um, a, lot of, a lot of middle class suburban women. Um, and one of the things that happened is they, um, I think, figured out but it took them a little while that they needed to learn how to build bigger structures. So they would gather together in little groups in the suburb, and there would be other groups, and they didn't know how to. There are techniques like, every, like let's all elect a representative and send them to one statewide conference. And that just is a good idea, but it doesn't come naturally. You don't just automatically know it, and I think we need to learn it. And we also had a question right in the front as well. Uh, you want to wait for the mic, so I think, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, sorry, I took the question. Um, I wanted to know if you think that it's possible to combat the kind of moral flexibility that comes up in the tragedy of the commons, um, if you think it's possible, or like what the best way is to kind of assume accountability for that in the group situation? Yeah, so I think we know a lot about, so a couple of the other questions are real hard questions that I didn't give very satisfactory answers. But that one, I think we know the answer, which is there are these principles of design principles. So I just gave you the one, which is you, you try to make sure that there's a penalty for bad behavior, but you make it very mild. But there are a bunch of others. I mean, one is you, you try to um, create systems in which it's more clear who's in and who's out so that um, those, and that, so that those who are, are, are in get some benefit that they know they're getting. So for example, Providence College has, has a students who have student IDs and are listed. And so PC is a, is a category that, of people. It's PC students are a category. And because it's a category that's got a limitation around it, it works better. It would be much more difficult to accomplish anything if there was no boundary. Now, the boundary is also problematic. And I know you spend a lot of your time worrying about, and so do so other people, about who gets left out then of PC, neighbors, for example. But if you don't have a boundary at all, you can't function. So designing boundaries well so that also there are ways in across them is part of it. And so there's a bunch of, this is something where I think we can learn from experience. And um, also very important to keep a kind of optimism that is, is possible to solve that problem. Uh, because lots and lots of human beings have solved it. And then try to learn from exactly how they did it. It's know-how. It's like, um, it's another word for it is artisanship. We can be artisans of our world if we know the techniques. OK. Uh, I'm uh, the widow of a philosophy professor ah. here. Uh, and. I, I've been very involved in the abortion issue, and I remember getting invited to something at Cambridge Institute for Family Self Research or something, and they got people on both sides together and tried to get them to listen to each other, best will in the world. Grew up, of course. You know, you mean you would do that? Mm -hmm. You would have an abortion while you're waiting for your health insurance to come through? You mean you would do that? You know, and I, I just, it seems that sometimes the more you listen to what these people, the other people on the other side say, right. the less you come to an agreement because you hit these landmines. Right. Well, a couple of things. I mean, one is I do think it's worth being realistic. So this is not, I'm not standing up here telling us, telling you that um, discussion in the public sphere is always leads to agreements. It definitely doesn't. And actually, we need to be somewhat tolerant of of continued conflict, right? Because we do live with other people who disagree with us. Um, the second point is I think you can structure conversations like that better and worse. So there have been examples of productive conversation about. Yeah. Well, you can also, you can also structure really badly so that it's. Right, so there can be counterproductive designs. The other thing is abortion is a very difficult as a philosopher, I think it's a very difficult issue because it goes to basic metaphysical questions which are really hard to discuss. So the opposite example would be a budget where you can, after all, split the difference, right? I want a million dollars for it, you want zero. 500,000 is in between a million and, and zero, and so we can get there. So there are the negotiable 
issues and the non-negotiable, and the non-negotiable are the toughest ones. So I, I, I don't want to overgeneralize from the most non-negotiable issues. It's a matter of life and death, and yet and freedom and not freedom, and and it goes to metaphysics, and that's a, and it's connected to faith, and those things are tough. I mean, that's the toughest, perhaps. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Jeff Nicholas in the philosophy department. Yeah. Do you mind going back one slide? Yeah. Thanks. So I, I have two questions. Yeah. The first one is about the, the three people that you're working with because one doesn't seem to fit with the other two. Uh, okay. So Ostrom and Habermas have made their peace with capitalism. I don't think Gandhi or King ever did. And so I'm wondering strategically how that works in your book. How, didn't you, how can you um, bring those ideas together and make them work when they have very different kinds of ideas of what society should be like and what the challenges to society are like. Uh, and I'm really curious about Habermas. Um, most of us on the left have you know, said goodbye to him a long time ago, and we look to Marcuse. Uh, I myself am a McIntyre guy, so uh, I look at McIntyre and Marcuse, and, and Habermas is you know, a utilitarian. We don't need to really talk to him anymore. Um, the, the other uh, question that I had, though, uh, I think more substantively, is we're, we're dealing with really important questions here, but, but the presentation seems to come, come from a particularly Euro-Western perspective. Uh -huh. um, and so yep. the work that I do uh, is with Native Americans and yep. uh, thinking about nature and how do we give nature a voice in this conversation, right? That would be some of the questions that we would get from the Lakota or the um, you know, uh, other people in the, the Native uh, Sorry, sorry. Um, so I'm just curious yeah. how you would bring that into the conversation. Yeah, thank you. No, it's all really. Well, and I really enjoyed your conversation. Oh, by the no, way. thank I, you. I'm going to read your book. So thanks. Oh, thank you. No, and all your all your comments or questions are really really good. I'm just trying to figure out how to address a bit of it. Um, I do think the book has a kind of bias based on what I know, and um, so I just would own that. I um, uh, actually am interested in my next steps in trying to broaden my own understanding. One of the things I'm trying to do, I, I don't speak good Spanish because I never studied it, but one of the things I'm trying to do right now is actually work with people in the Spanish-speaking world to develop a whole different reading list, which is all originally written either in Spanish or in native um, indigenous languages from the Americas. And so I'm really going to do that in the spring. Um, and it'll be learning for me because it, you know, I, so that part, last part I just say, you're right, and I, I just need to learn more things. Um, I'm on my own journey. Um, the, the person who's not Western is, is Gandhi, and he's really not. I mean, he's a critic of, of the West, but he's only a little part of the book. Um, something to say about the, the capitalism question is, for those who don't know these figures, and there's no reason you would, they are ideologically kind of strange bedfellows. So Eleanor Ostrom is, um, some people would put her on the right, and um, there's a portrait of her on the wall at this uh, libertarian Research Center in Virginia, they love her. I, I don't think it's completely fair, but it's also not completely wrong. Habermas started off as a lefty and then left our lefties behind. And then, you know, King, King of course, is a deep critic of capitalism, especially in the last years, and Gandhi in a diff different way. So there, there, there are basically four perspectives on capitalism um, that are different from each other. And um, I uh, think that a good criticism of the book would say that I don't deal with that well enough. So I'll just say that. I might be trying to decenter that question a little and say that we don't have to have a view of that that decides everything else. That, we, that if you ask the question, what should we do, you don't have to have a view of global capitalism. But I might also be wrong. So I'm the guy, I just, basically I need to think about that. But it might be interesting for students to realize that this is a little bit of an um, ideological mishmash and that actually I like that. Hi, sorry about that. Um, my name is Mason Wasserman. I'm a sophomore psych major and Spanish minor. And I want to kind of cycle back a little bit to what you were talking about, about the kind of like the metaphysical and like religious debates. I'm just kind of curious. I apologize in advance how like of a loaded question this is. Like how do you kind of grapple with some of the questions about like these metaphysical concepts that like they, that some, I apologize, I'm not wording this properly, but some of these things, don't seem to have a importance or I guess relevance outside of the context of life. And I guess some people use like religion as a means to justify why 
like you should or shouldn't do certain things. So I'm just curious, like your take on that. Right. Um, well, it actually goes back to the previous question because if you think that nature deserves a voice, and I, 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 I'm moved by that. I'm not. A, I'm not. I don't disagree. But then you are saying something about um, nature that is different from if you. Uh, well, it, it, it's different if you think it's that the only the only thing that matters in the world is the human being, and nature is is um, a means. So it's it, what we're talking about here is the deep philosophical questions and how do they fit in, right? It goes the abortion question is another one, but um, how do the really deep philosophical questions fit in? So um, that this is really great. I've never thought about this before. I mean, this is not a book about those questions, but I think somebody could look at it. Um, the previous question was really kind of saying that, is that there is a bunch of assumptions, metaphysical assumptions here. And they're basically um, all human beings count. They all count um, infinitely and equally, and nothing else counts. Um, I, I, I caught myself because I started off saying we human beings can't figure out what we should do in any other way than by talking about it in, in, a, in a room with religious symbolism. There's obviously people in the room, I hope there are people in the room who think that we ha do have another mechanism of finding out what's right, which is to pray. I, I, I respect that. I, I forgot about it, though. So there's, which is to say there's probably a bias loaded into the book. The, the different question is how much does it matter? Um, most conversation in the actual world is not about the deepest philosophical questions. It's about the budget. It's about the police. It's about climate. It's not about the deepest philosophical questions. So am I making a mistake by not talking about them? I, I don't know. Maybe. I have to think about it more. I mean, those questions do mess up con ordinary conversations, to be honest, right? Because we don't know how to make progress on them. Any final questions for Dr. Levine? Well, then I guess I'll ask you to do two things. The second of which is to join us next door to continue the conversation in the great room. And the first thing is to give a rousing round of applause to show your gratitude for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.